live, and now I'm going to tell everybody else about where to go in YouTube here. Okay, so I'm just watching a YouTube window to see it, make sure that it goes live before I actually start. Yep. And, uh, that usually takes a minute or so to get going. Here it comes, and we see you. Okay. So we'll give people a chance to to connect for just a moment and then we'll get going in just a second here. I gotta get a better webcam. So we're gonna give us get started here. Uh, welcome everyone to another Full Circle Magic Q&A session and today we are honored to be talking with the legendary mentalist Kenton Nepper whose groundbreaking approach has been amazing audiences and winning followers for decades. Kenton is the, uh, the creator of, well, so many products I can't even think of them all, but the, the, the incredible Wonder Words, which, is, uh, which has brought a whole legion of young mentalists to a new way of approaching mentalism, and uh, many other products that we'll be talking about today. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Kenton Nepper. Good afternoon, Kenton. Good afternoon. Great to be in touch with everybody. Awesome. Really, really is a privilege to uh, to see you again and see you here on a on a, a Q and A for Full Circle. Um, I know we have a lot of people excited to be watching today, and uh, if anyone can't get out of work in time to see this, they'll be uh, delighted to be able to see this later on in its recorded version. So, so let's uh, let's start with a couple of simple things that people always love to know. Um, and uh, one thing people really like to do sometimes, I think, is just go way back in the past with you and find out how did you get started in this crazy business, and what was what were some of your original inspirations? Well, uh, it goes way back because uh, my first paid performance, I was eight years old. Um, before that, I was um, I I took magic classes at the uh, YMCA. Uh, there was a person that did taught classes there, um, and I started going to that. And uh, by the time by the time I was eight years old, that teacher had me lecture on the history of magic for that magic. So uh, when it hit, it hit you know the bug hit <laughs> pretty intensely. I tend to do a lot of things pretty intensely. So um, and uh, after that, I was fortunate enough to live in a even though I lived in a smaller town, I had. Uh, several uh, very hard-working magic teachers. So uh, I was on, uh, let's see, I was on a, one of my teachers was a comedy uh, burlesque style magician. He also had a local television show. He was also had a traveling hypnosis show. Uh, he was also head of mental, Iowa Mental Health Association. Um, that was one of my teachers. Another one of my teachers had a, a gospel magic show that was a full illusion show. I traveled with that. And uh, then, uh, so let's see, I had the comedy magic show I traveled with, the hip show, the illusion show. Oh, and then I did close-up, and I had my own uh, show and my own pretty magic where I did doves and rabbits and flowers and all that kind of stuff. And close-up. So, uh, and uh, some of my first work after doing stage things was performing close-up a lot, and I worked close-up, oh, I still do, I've worked close-up magic all my life. So all of that happened, then I became a student of a uh, technical card guy, John Mendoza, um, and, and uh, worked with him for several years. It just, I just constantly trained and kept performing. Well, I don't know. Then I moved out, I moved out here <laughs> to Phoenix, and um, Soon after I moved out here, and a couple of years after I was out here doing magic, um, there was some buzz because I had been talking about this thing that I called lingu linguistic deception, 
And um, that brought me into a fold of uh, some, an upstarting thing here that was something with uh, Robert Blumley started uh, along with Larry Becker uh, called the Six and a Half Mentalist Group. And uh, so I ended up being in with them, which was Doc Hilford and, uh, let's see, and, and the Earl and uh, Mark Strivings and Larry and Dr. Juris, and, and so it just it became this very heady mentalist group, and I, I got into that because I was considered a real thinker as well as a creator, and uh, they didn't think that people who were great thinkers and creators belonged to magic, they must be a mentalist, and that's how they got me in the group, I guess. I don't know. This was before you really considered yourself uh, specializing in mentalism, if you do consider it then. Yeah, I still don't. Uh, but but most people in the, around the world and in, in in within our business do. Um, I you know my I kind of got the rap of being a mentalist by doing close up because I would do things with cards and stuff that happened to involve readings and um, yeah, doing things that the the way I would do the reading would then reveal their card and that's that was just so I thought I was doing close up you know and other people said oh no that's mentalism and I went well. I also know mentalism. I've been doing different other mentalism things all my life too. But I never. I just always when I the age I grew up in, mentalism was part of magic. It was just a given. And all the big names in mentalism: Dunninger, Nelson, Anneman, you name it. They all did magic. I mean, that was the Anneman wrote more card tricks than he ever wrote mentalism. You know, so. That was just normal. Dunninger did the linking rings on stage. Kreskin did, you know, tons of magic in with his mentalism. That, so that was just normal uh, to me. And and my audiences sure don't know the difference. You know, they they just take everything I do as important, and that's that's that. You know, I'm really glad you make that point because you know, uh, in our discussions uh, on Full Circle and, and many other places. You know, there seems to always be some kind of argument about the separation of mentalism and magic, and there are many, you know, who argue that there isn't such a great separation. Point out as you did, how many of the greats, you know, incorporated magic into their acts, and no one really made a distinction. Well, yeah, that, I think it comes down to. I think part of the argument is, well, magic is tricks, and mentalism looks believable, um, but but I think that that's highly debatable. I mean, I. I know plenty of mentalists that I wouldn't believe them for a moment what they're doing, um, and, and and I know magicians who who their past looks far more realistic than a lot of mentalists doing a billet switch. So I don't know that that, that that's that's necessarily true. Plus, mentalists love to do mentalism, and then the current trend is to go then say, but it's not real. It's not real. Well, then okay, the mentalism isn't any different than magic. <laughs> you know, right. Right. it's the same. It's the same thing. Okay, well, this is a trick too. Okay, well then it, you might as well do it all. To me, it comes. I think any of this issue comes from. It has to be about who you are, and 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 I know this is going to sound you know philosophical, but it's actually really practical. If even if if your whole audience is nothing but a couple of your friends, whatever you do should kind of reflect what you're about. For me. I started doing pieces of mentalism because it helped kind of tell my inner world story to other people, you know, without telling a story. It was like, well, I dreamt of things bending in my in my dreams. So metal bending was something that in the back of my mind, my psyche went, yeah, we could do that. So that was an expression of that. Um, I had a lot of experiences when I was very young um, that that connected me to people in ways that were unusual. So my mentalism made sense for me to do that. If, if I grew up in a time where um, I was not allowed to think any of those things that happened to me were real, and I had to dismiss them and shove them down as hard as possible, and then only believe in whatever the, the current explanations would be, like, well, it must have been a mental trick, then I would go out and perform just mental tricks if I believed that. You know, I think whatever you perform should be representative of who, wh what you're about. That's all. You know, and it doesn't matter. You can be, you know, whole. You can be highly skeptical. You can be cynical. You can be really have had other experiences that you want to communicate. All those are fine. You just need it to represent what you're about. That's all. 
And that doesn't matter if you only do one trick. Right. It should still be true to you, you know. That that is that is great advice, and uh, you know may help a lot of people coming into the in, into the business think a little more clearly about it. You know, as long as it strikes me, as long as I'm thinking about you know things that people find controversial or have disagreement about with mentalism, um, another uh, another item that comes up all the time, and I'd love to hear your feelings about it, are the issues of of um, of disclaiming psychic power, of justifications, you know, for how it is you're performing, whether you need to have a character that justifies how, how you're doing it, whether it be a psychic power uh, versus uh, psychology, body language, NLP, about uh, people being afraid to edge over into the area of claiming psychic powers and not wanting to be accused of exploiting people uh, who, are, who are vulnerable, because certainly a lot of that goes on, um, and, and whether whether a mentalist, someone who's a mentalist, should really feel that they have to necessarily pick a specific power or or capability, or whether they can, you know, can be a little bit looser about it, and not necessarily have to define themselves so closely, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, again, um, I I'm fond of working from the inside out. I, I just don't any other art form. I don't care what it is, and whether it's painting or music or anything else. You don't start off by saying, well, now, what does it look like outside, and how will I put that into my art? You say, well, what am I, how do I feel? What do I want to talk about? What do, I, you know, what do I care about? What am I passionate about? And then I'll put that into my music, or I'll put that into my art. If, if we want to treat magic and mentalism like an art, then we have to start from the inside out. It's, it's just insane to do it any other way. But let's just ignore that whole topic and not think about it at all for a minute. When it comes to disclaimers... Um, my disclaimer is is honest for me, um, and I don't suggest anybody else say this because it's probably not true for you. But for me, this is this came from an honest evaluation about what I was about. I say to my audience, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm about to do is not real. And half the audience kind of applauds or snickers or laughs. And then I say, and what I'm about to do is not fake. On the other half of the audience kind of applause and snickers. And then I say, what I do is symbolic. And then they all nod their heads and I go on. And that's true, because what I do is symbolic of my magic and mentalism is largely, not always, but largely symbolic of things that are true of my inner life and my actual personal experience. It's not to preach or to make somebody believe what I believe. It's simply, as a performer, as, a, as an artist, it's about I'm going to perform this stuff because it represents something about who I really am inside of me. That's all. And so whatever your disclaimer is should be that. You know, if, if you say, I don't believe in anything, the only thing I trust is science, then you should only use science as your method and do science in an entertaining way. And don't tell me you can't do that, because you can. There's lots of science that's entertaining. You know? Uh, there's, there's just, uh, to me, it's just about being honest with your audience and saying this is where I'm coming from. If, on the other hand, I'll go way back to when I first moved here, 30 some odd years ago, I walked into a magic shop. There was a famous magician and also mentalist who was in the shop, who said, well, it's nice chatting with you. I gotta go and do this reading out in this high-end part of town. I'll be back after a while. He came back. He had a load of money in his hands, and he was snickering at the stupid person that hired him to do a reading for them, what idiots they were, and he just went on and on and on trashing them. Well, that that's horrible. I'm sorry. That's just plain horrible. You know? On the other hand, if you went out to do a reading for somebody and you actually cared about them, and what you did was help them understand themselves, and you got paid for it, I don't have a big problem with that. I have a problem with you giving advice, you know. I don't think you should ever give people advice, because then you're taking responsibility for their lives. Right, right, great you point. Great so, point. And I go into a lot of this in great depth and, and how to get around all that in things like the mind reading lessons right. um, and things like that, because those, all those issues are really important to me. But I think you have to come from a place of integrity within yourself, whatever that is, you know. Right. And if you if, if, basically, if as long as you're not exploiting people and entertaining them and maybe making them feel better, I think it's okay. But you have to really watch out. There's a lot of exploiters in the world. 
Um, well, look, there, there's a, we do a lot of harm in a lot of ways. I think I think we should take the Hippocratic oath, at least the first part of it, seriously, and think yeah. in magic and mentalism. First, do no harm. Right. You know, and and because look, it wasn't that many decades ago when it was really normal for a magician to get somebody up on stage and go, hey kid, what's your problem? Stand up straight, what's wrong with you? Stand over here, oh, on this spot right here, oh, did you make that spot? Ha 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 ha, you know? Right. I mean, uh, putting down people, that's really damaging, that's horribly damaging to people's yeah. psyches. Yeah. That's, it's just as bad or if not worse than some of the readings where at least sometimes people get positive messages, you know? Sure, sure. No, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I think, you know, magic had a bad reputation for a while. There was so many people being belittled on uh, in front of audiences. Absolutely. And I do have a question that's just popped into the thread from Laura Isley, and uh, that she says, I'm going to just give it to you straight, she says it fits into this uh, conversation, but I'll just give it to you as she's asking it and let you come up with your own answer. She, Laura asks, what is your definition of pure mentalism? I, you know, uh, to this day, I don't. When people say I want, I want to learn more mentalism from you, I don't even know what that means. I, I really don't. I think, I, I think we're very convoluted about all that, and I, I don't think most people who say I'm a pure mentalist knows what what they mean either, because um, they still don't want to use cards, or they don't. You know, they have these weird notions. Mentalism, the term mentalism, one of the one of the historic places it comes from is hermetic magic. So, you know, her, her, mentalism was called the first principle in ancient magic. Um, and if we look at it from that way, mentalism in that term meant where we got the name from. Mentalism meant the universe is essentially mental, that thoughts are things, that what you put into your mind creates vibrations and, and causes ripples out in the world. It, so, I mean, by that definition, magic tricks are mentalism, right? Because if you make something appear and disappear, it could be mentalism. That's right. Right. Exactly. You know, so I, I don't know what we mean by that. I think mentalism is a funny uh, term we like to throw around like we're much better than magicians, but really most mentalists don't know what mentalism is anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I think I think you know it may refer to the... Uh, I, I've seen the term tossed around recently in the idea that you know, the, as you said yourself a minute ago, if you're using billets, if you're using cards and props and such, that somehow that's not as pure as simply uh, speaking to someone and reading their mind. Well, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there is, yes, there is that, and I'm, I'm guilty of starting a lot of that. Um, and my students certainly, uh, certainly have, <laughs> have encouraged that. Well, Guys like very good at it. Fraser Parker and and uh, Luca Volpe. But, but I, what I'll say is. Um, the point the point about that is is that you want to give a realistic experience how, however you do that right. uh, I think a lot of a lot of people who want to be mentalists um, more than magicians um, what they do is they see things on television then they see things on YouTube and they uh, see people do various things and they say yeah, I want to do that and what they don't realize is they're, they have to have post-production to cut up the film. They have to have pre-show. They have to do billet switch off camera. There's right. a lot of stuff that's going on that they don't even know about, and then they write and say, they, and I get these kind of emails. I want to be able to know somebody's PIN number, but I don't want any dual reality, and I don't want to have to, like, guess and then have to adjust, and I don't want to do any, like, sleight of hand. What 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 book is that in? And no memorization. No memorization. It's like it's not in a book. There is no such thing. Right. Well, that would be. I, I, you know, I think actually, magicians and mentalists, in some way, I, I think there's a part of all of us, um, whether it's magic or mentalism, that we're still looking to recapture that wonder that we had when we had no idea how it was happening, and and felt that if we could just get the next secret, we would find the real magic. And I think we're all looking for that still, in, in many ways. Yeah. But see, it doesn't. Doesn't that hint at something about us? See, now, now let me go <laughs> semi-psychological here for a moment. This is, Carl Jung would say, of course, that's, of course, that's why you do magic and mentalism, because it's, it's the psyche's way of dealing with itself. That it is, it's, it's our back of our mind, our inner world, where magic is real. 
and and so we have to kind of kind of come to grips with the idea that, oh, we want magic and mentalism to be real. Right. Uh, the problem is we have this horrible internal conflict with ourselves right now where we want magic and mentalism to be real. No, we don't. Yes, we do. No, we, oh, no, we don't want to say that to people. Well, then we have to have a disclaimer. Yeah, but we want it. No, you don't. That's not right to want it. That's not scientific. And so we have this horrible conflict within ourselves, and it comes out as really messy unclear, I'm not sure if I'm a magician or mentalist, and I'm not sure if I think it's real or not, or here, the, I did this, it's real, don't ever believe that. I mean, it's it's a horrible mixed message that we put out there because we're fighting within ourselves about it. What you said is, don't we want that real, we want people to have that real experience? Yes, but why? Why do we want people to have that real? Because we want them to feel wonder. That's That doesn't mean anything. We want them to feel that because we felt it, and it reminds us of something deep inside of us. That's right. why magic and mentalism works. It reminds us of some incredible, possible, fantastical power or possibility within us. Well, yeah. if we come to grips with that, then you end up where I am, which is great. So it doesn't matter what I do as long as I bring that feel to whatever I'm doing. That's good. It doesn't matter if I do that in a card trick or if I do it by reading your mind or bending things or anything else. You'll go, sure. wow, thanks for reminding me that there's something more than just the mundane reality. Yeah. I mean, th this is actually why I love watching people myself who do such a great job because I don't spend my time, if I'm watching a great magician myself, and I certainly don't know how everything is done, and I don't necessarily want to know. I, I'm not going to sit, you know, you know what it was? It was, um, I guess it was actually Richard Osterlin when I, I was in a class with him, and he said, you know, if you sit in the, the latest you know, science fiction epic by Steven Spielberg, do you spend the entire time you're watching the movie, analyzing the effects, and, and saying, oh, that's not real, this is how he did it, or do you get into the story? And you can worry about well, the effects later well, on. This, this is very pertinent. I don't know about there, but I know in this country, um, and I think probably in many countries, uh, certainly in Europe, um, we have a big thing going on right now, which is, uh, yes, we do have scientists that are quick to get on television to say the problem with that movie is this isn't scientifically right and that's not scientifically yeah. right, and don't uh, that's horrible. Yeah. And then they, they whine because, because the public gets all upset with them. It's like they don't understand that everything isn't about their point of view. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and magic and mentalism is about an alternate point of view. That's what it's supposed to be about. Sure. Um, we're very, we've gotten a very confused in my view, and there are people I love dearly and I respect who have the opposite point of view, uh, some of whom um, you know, literally walk on stage and say, the next trick is done with a thread. Okay? Sure. It's done with a thread, and now that we've told you, figure it out. And then they do a wonderful floating thing, and everybody loves it. But to me, you've just taken magic out of the wonderful into the now it's an magic is only about an intellectual thing. It well, is now, can you guess how I do the trick? Right. Well, that's good for a while, <laughs> but that's going to cut a whole lot of people out from I'd rather go see a concert sure. where I'm moved sure. emotionally. Well, my, the you know, well, I, can, I can intellectually contain myself a lot. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, a concert's going to have its own magic. Music is its own form of magic. But, I mean, it, there are a lot of Absolutely. people, you know, again, now, I, and I think it's a good thing that, uh, you know, are trying to push back against magic being relegated to the status of a puzzle. Because a puzzle is, you know, if you can figure it out, great. Get out your puzzle. If, if, go, go to the store and get a puzzle. Right. I mean, this is, this is the thing we used to always say, oh, that's a horrible trick, it's just as a puzzle. And now it's become, oh, it's good, it's just a puzzle, and which I, it's just the opposite of, of everything we were ever taught. And the reason it is so is because uh, there are a few very loud people that don't want people to buy into anything fantastical at all. It, may, it must be exactly what they believe and what they know is scientifically right at the moment, and that's all. Right. And, and that's okay. I don't have, you know, again, I have dear friends who have some of those points of view, and they differ with my point of view. That's fine. I just think we need to keep in mind, as performers, that we should have a vast 
experience and that people want to watch magic and mentalism you know when people get upset with if you go if you work close up a lot and I have for decades you know and if you go up to people and say they say oh you're a magician some of them go oh great and some of them go oh I, I, yeah no that's okay and and when you find out why they they're not happy about it they go oh, I don't like to feel stupid right right you know Yep. And what is that? Because they're not allowed to be fantastical. It has to be just an intellectual construct. Well, I think that that's, that's what turns people away from magic and mentalism. So we don't want it to just be an intellectual construct. I think, I think that's missing the boat. Right. You know? Right. Uh, and Can I, let, me, uh, let me give you a, a, a symbolic, maybe a symbolic version, representation and talking about my past. Because I started doing... Um, you know, metal bending now has become the spoon trick, <laughs> right. which irritates me to no end. But when I was, you know, because for years of doing, decades of doing close-up, nobody came up to me and said, well, you do that spoon trick, you know. But in the last 10 years or so, there are lots of people that come up and say, oh, good, you do magic. Do you do, the, do, you do that spoon trick thing? You know, well, that's horrible because... And it's because we started treating things that are powerful as if they're just another trick. Right. And we don't care because as long as it feeds our ego, that's all we care about. I don't think that that's, that's really true. And if we want to do realistic mentalism, we can't have that approach. We have to look at it as, what is this real? And why do I want to give them this experience? What do I want to share with them as an experience? Not look at me, look at me. So um, I, you know, I started doing metal bending back in the 70s. There, there weren't too many of us, you know. Uri inspired a handful of us. Um, Uri was big. There was a guy named Steve Shaw, right? Uh, that one of the psychic kids that uh, that was with Steve Shaw, a guy named Mike, actually came off of my show. He was the other kid. Steve and I did not know each other for decades till decades later. Wow. But the other psychic kid was on from my show. Uh, he didn't know any metal bending because I wouldn't teach him because <laughs> he, he had a capacity to sometimes measure illusions backstage and make his own for his own show, so he eventually got kicked <laughs> off my show. But um, yeah. but it was it was kind of that kid, but more Steve. Uh, Steve really taught James Randi a lot more about bending too. So Steve, James a bit, Uri, and myself in the States, and that was kind of it back then, yeah. you know. Um, and certainly as far as performing it in a regular show, um, there weren't too many of us in the, you know, in the 70s. So uh, bending has been the closing of my act, whether it was magic or mentalism, for, for many, 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 many years. Uh, so let me, I'd like to show you just a quick example of something. Absolutely. Of how, how the difference is to me between how stuff gets handled in a non-realistic way and how things should be handled in mentalism so it's more realistic. Um, so instead of spoons, uh, you know, keys are very common. Now I know a lot of guys today carry spoons and forks with them and they're doing close up and they go, hey, let me show you something. And they reach in their pocket and take out, I don't know, I guess they're going to sit down and have dinner with people. I don't know. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, it, that. Um, if you're in a restaurant, it makes perfectly good sense. If you're on stage, you're fine taking out spoons and forks. You know, walking around, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to carry a lot of silverware with you necessarily. <laughs> but, um, but keys, you know, keys are still common. And uh, so, um, so metal keys. I don't know. I'm going to try to see if you can. Can you see that there's like two no, different colored keys? No, okay. That's great. So great. So we have. Two keys. Um, now, I'm just going to use two for the example to make it clear. But um, And what I really care about doing here is I want to make sure, I, I don't have a table here, so I'll use my hand. Let me see if I can. Um, That's yeah, good. going to be a little, but just so you can, okay. So you can see how that doesn't bend a, a whole lot. It's not like bent because when I push down on it, it doesn't go way up, right? And the, on the other one, I want to check this too. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, yeah, see how that's kind of bent? So when okay. I push on it, it bends up. That's because this has a little, a little. I don't know if you can see it, but it has a little, a tiny bend in it, but it's enough that it's a bend. So we always want to use this greatest 
one in a test condition. So I'll use the silver one. Now, to me, if you're really going to bend metal, all right, it wouldn't be a quick anything. It would be this. Imagine if you could just take the key and then bend it like that, right? You check them both and then you do it. That would be real to me. So it would look more, well, you wouldn't do anything, really. You would just kind of hold it. Beautiful. Now that's a really bent up key. Right. You know? But but nowhere did did we take two keys and say, watch, okay, watch, watch, watch. Okay, now <laughs> because then it's a coin trick, you know, and that that's the problem. There's too much metal bending going on now that's, that looks either like, okay, watch, 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 watch. And it's like, watch what? I can barely see anything. You're swatting flies. You know? <laughs> or, right. or, it's, or, or it's like, okay, I have a key. I have a key. Okay. Uh, and I, oh, look over here. Look, 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 look. <laughs> no, then it's misdirection. <laughs> that's, yep. it, it isn't real. And, and, and we don't like to look. If you want to go after pure mentalism, that's what you want. You want things to look that simple, that clean, that slowed down, clear, right. so that when people see it, they go, There's, there is no physical way. You know? Um, and th by the way, there, I, there's no gimmicks, and I really only use two keys. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, I don't have any extra devices palmed or any of that nonsense. There's no misdirection to it or anything. So, uh, to me... That's what we want to go for, and the way you do a combination of everything, psychological stuff, philosophical stuff, yeah. as well as mechanical things, understanding physics and the mind and everything else. So you put all of it together, and that to me is, is closer to pure, pure mentalism, you know? Right. And that, by the way, is the, one of a bunch of things, and uh, I, just, I just released another, the, the, some of the key work, um, recently because I uh, just released it because I had a discussion with some people and they, they weren't aware that I did those things, you know, because I don't let most uh, magicians see too much of my metal bending stuff. Sure, so sure. Um, that is now out the market along with some, it, it's a whole set that talks about my psychology and philosophy of metal bending and also um, a, a whole bunch of other things. So go to the website and check it out. Yep. Uh, in fact, I, I uh, just to mention, we you know we just put a link to your website, uh, the product pages on the on our thread there. So anybody who's interested can find that, and we'll we'll give a kind of a comprehensive list of links and some of the things that that uh, are available from you. Um, and I got to say that your other work on metal bending, which you had a package deal a few months back, um, I forget the exact name, but it were repaired. Uh, a pair of products oh, from yeah, two different metal bending things. Yeah, well, a bending one and bending two. Yeah. And there was yeah. some really. I mean, I've, again, I've been uh, doing some of that myself for for a number of years. But you had some not only some great um, subtleties and and fine points of presentation, uh, but also uh, a technique or two that I'd never seen before. Let me tell you, and and it had a great impact, uh, as I, I mentioned to you yesterday. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things because I because I started doing metal bending so long ago, most of my stuff doesn't look like other people's metal bending because I, I didn't have other people to show me you, you want to do it this way. I, I kind of get a kick out of some of the things that people discover because it's, it's like, yeah, well, I was doing that in the 70s. So <laughs> right. I'm glad it's due to you, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I, I somebody once uh, got all excited and told me that they had, they had uh, this great thing. They realized, uh, you know, that metal bending had to do with with optical stuff. And they went, Wait, "This is news to you." <laughs> well, you are. How long have you been doing bending? <laughs> you are using your eyes. You know, of course. Sure. <laughs> of course, it's optical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but it, you know, it's like, well, okay, you know. <laughs> that is funny. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of beeps from the thread here. I'm just going to look through it for a second and see about questions that people are asking. And uh, I'm actually going to take it kind of from the top here. But we have uh, one, of our, one of our own uh, FCM administrators, Joaquin Ayala, is asking, 
I'm curious, how likely are you to use the creations of others in your work, or do you use your own most often? Also, are there any of your own effects that either exceeded your expectations or didn't live up to them the way you thought they would? Why and how? Ah, great questions. Uh, well, first of all, most of everything I do is my own. Um, yeah, there, are, there are a few exceptions um, where I will take uh, a some little something, like uh, my friend Larry Becker's, you know, one of his flashback books I might put into a set of my books that I use for readings, you know, for a trick, um, for a book test. But um, for the most part, most of what I do is, is mine. Um, and that's just because over the years, you know, things I totally created, totally new things, or things that I learned, uh, in my close-up, there's a bit I do that's that really began as a as a couple of tricks of my of my friend Paul Harris's. That over the years, again starting back you know, 70s early 80s doing that stuff, it evolved into something that's mine. You know, something different. But um, for the most part, I tend to do. For the most part, you know, I've created a lot of stuff, and there's a reason I I, I don't create stuff just to try to get people to buy stuff. You know, I create things because I, I want magic and mentalism to be better, so I tend to, do, tend to use the things I create. Um, anything that exceeded my... Exp there are things all the time that kind of surprise me, um, but usually it's more... I, I have a pretty good sense of what works for real audiences because I've been doing this a long time. So for the most part, I can look at something and go, mm, yeah, it sounds good in theory, but I don't think that's going to fly. And it usually doesn't, you know, whether it's mine or somebody else's. You know, or I can look at something and go, yeah, that should really work. And most of the time, I'm pretty pretty, pretty right on. Um, one of, I, I'm more actually surprised by what, what goes gangbusters with magicians and that that's that is something I'm often still surprised about um, and you know all the pros joke about that that we have no idea <laughs> we know what really works for real audiences we have no idea what magicians and mentalists will decide <laughs> if something is good because it has nothing to do with what really works for audiences right you know so um, I'm I'm uh, you know I think it's interesting I was surprised when colossal killer became a mentalist thing mainly, right? Because um, Colossal Killer was created be because I needed. I was doing close up all the time, and I needed an out, you know. Yep. Um, and I spent three and a half years trying to figure out complex mathematical calculations and all sorts of stuff to be able to do to have an answer, so that no matter what somebody did, I would have the card or know what it is. Um, without card counting and all sorts of other stuff. And uh, then one night at like 3 in the morning, uh, the answer hit me. I woke up, and I went, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? and there it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Inspiration. that's, you know, I, that's kind of surprised me that it's, it's everything that it is now. Right, um, right. You know, other things I think I've done that are really, really important, people have not figured out why it's important yet, which... My audiences know and pros know, but a lot of other people haven't figured that out yet. Well, maybe it's waiting to be discovered. I, it's all waiting of... to be discovered for sure. That's right. Let me, let me continue because people are posting questions. I've got one from Matt Chalk, who's actually another one of our Full Circle admins. And uh, he's a young fellow actually uh, from, I believe, New Zealand and uh, very interested in creating effects. So his question is, what advice would you give to a young creator in the mentalism field? First of all, make sure that you're creating stuff that you actually want to perform and that you feel is the best way to do something. Uh, you know, you'll always top yourself, but but start there. Here's I want to make the ultimate. Colossal Killer for me was the ultimate out. You know, um, understanding the importance of language and stuff was right. Whoops. You still got a connection? Try to create all. Try to create ultimates for yourself. That's important. Um, and the other thing I would say, and this is really important, is to know what's already been created. <laughs> I, sure. Now, I know, that, I know that's going to sound silly, but uh, I'll give you an example. I don't want to pick on any particular person because 
this, uh, but I just had an interaction with a, a friend the other day, um, and mind you, unlike most people, this guy is not only a good thinker, he's also a real a real mensch. He's a real decent person and, and behaves appropriately. But um, he was pretty excited because he came up with a way of marking a deck. And I saw it and said, I have, I said, thanks, Ted. Now, a couple people listening are laughing and everybody else is saying, what does that mean? But thanks, Ted, is the way I check when I see these kind of things, if somebody, how somebody responds. And the guy said, I'm sorry, what do you mean? You know, pardon? And I said, Ted Leslie created that particular set of marking systems. And what you probably did is reverse engineered a trick thinking, well, I like the Boris Wild deck, but I don't like this, and blah, 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 blah. And you worked backwards to the original thing that inspired Boris. <laughs> you know? Right. So, so what you really need to know is the basics. You need to understand the basics of mentalism, period, and then you need to understand when you go to create something, you need to understand if anything else had been done like that before. Right. You right. know? It, it, you know, that leads directly into a question which people are always interested in, especially in mentalism studying. Uh, and a lot of people are very interested in breaking into mentalism because it's a hot topic these days for magicians. And, uh, and that is, aside from your own material, which is huge, what other of the book resources for mentalism, you know, we always mention 13 steps and animans, but, and that's pretty much getting with most people, but what kind of books would you recommend people trying to know that information, uh, you know, should be looking for? It sounds trite, but the truth is, yeah, I mean, even though it's dated, Animans, um, uh, Nelson, uh, there aren't a lot of people that read Nelson materials now, which I find incredibly odd. Nelson's, Nelson really created a lot of the act that we think of as Joe Dunninger's act and Kreskin's act, so... Yeah. You ought to be reading, reading Nelson stuff. Um, there's, I, I'm gonna, I'll tell you what I, what my teachers always told me, which is, yeah, get the jinx, read through the jinx. That'll give you a pretty good idea of mentalism. And after that, study psychology and theater. Great. Now I know that doesn't seem sexy. <laughs> But, but, and that's not what you want to hear. But my teachers, literally, I had several teachers that said, if you won't study theater and if you won't study psychology, you can't be a student of mine, period. Right. It's not negotiable. And I think that that's really important. So, um, you know, do yourself a world of good and study. If you're going to be a mentalist, study psychology. You sure. know, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll make you a little crazy, but... The good news is you also understand why we do things, and that's really helpful in mentalism. I think to, to, to touch on theater and psychology, I mean, that goes just as much for any magician as for mentalists as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I released a thing a year or two ago called uh, It's Suggestion, and in it is um, how various kinds of different ways we, we create and we suggest things to people. And part of that was... Uh, stage directions, whether it's on a close-up mat or, you know, you're standing in somebody's living room or you're on a stage, that where you stand or where you place an object actually suggests something suspicious or it suggests it's okay or it suggests it should be ignored. I mean, shouldn't you know that if you're, if you're going to ever perform, even if it's only for, like, three or four people? Wouldn't it be good to know that you can set something down in a certain area and they won't care? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I really, I really I mean, love that. Do you have any particular writings in that area which you can point people toward? Well, it's it's uh, it's called its suggestion. That's its suggestion. Uh, it's, a, okay. you know, it's suggestion is one I I would definitely say if you want to look at psychology and kind of influence and performance, that's that's one that's important. Um, a couple things I think that get lost that are really important are uh, mystery by association. That's another ebook you can get um, that is applies to magic and mentalism. Um, uh, has a lot of important principles, um, and same with genuine amazement, right? Gen genuine amazement and anti-tata. All of those are 
things that maybe at first glance you'll go, oh, is that just philosophy or something? I don't want to read that. Well, it's actually probably where a lot of the real work is hidden. So uh, those are those are definitely works I suggest you really, really look into if you want to be doing things, whether it's magic or mentalism, if you want to do it in a way that affects people and is powerful and uh, takes even simple things, makes it very powerful, that's what you need. Yep, yep. Okay, I'm going to, uh, to keep people happy, I'm going to jump back to the list for a second here. I don't want to neglect folks who are uh, typing things in. But we have a question from Randy Rogers saying, in magic, there is that magic moment where the audience believes that's when the magic happened. For mentalism, there's really no moment you know when the mind reading is happening. What are some of the techniques you have used to try to make that moment palpable? Excellent question. Um, you know, Sometimes uh, you don't need a moment, but um, I, I prefer to have moments that come from a connection with the audience. So uh, I, I, now some of you are going to go, oh, that's too touchy-feely and that's fine, you don't have to do this. But I would rather take somebody's hand, take it by the wrist and have it on my heart, and then start talking to them. You know, I would, I would then going like that, because this is like, come here, you're a dog, come here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Audience to feel like they're pets, you know? I, I want them to feel connected to me, you know? I mean, you tend, you, you probably don't go to a lot of concerts where they go, we hate you, we hate you, you audience, you suck, you know? You probably go to, unless you think that's funny, you know? But, but other than that, you probably go to concerts where they try to make you feel better about yourself, right? So why not make the, the moment in mentalism about something where you're connecting with people? Uh, and so to me, that's, that's, that, that really matters a lot. Now, that's not for everybody. So I'll, let, me, let me make this point. Um, I put out a really Im important purpose of mine uh, recently called The Ringing Heart. And, uh, you know, there are some people who just went, I would never buy that because that's smaltzy and that's cute and I would never do that. Well you're not working for enough real audiences then, you know, because real right. audiences are tears. You know, real audiences are like, oh, I love this guy. Right. You know, they kiss me because of this, you know. So mm -hmm. it's like, if you, you, you know, you, you, we've got to learn that connecting with an audience is important, you know, no matter how you do it. And one of the reasons I did The Ringing Heart, I finally released it, was I wanted people to have an example of, this is how you can connect two people. It's yeah, it's a pole stopping thing, but it but it's also involves symbolism. It has a silver heart. It has truisms. It right. you know, the heart rings true. You know your it's a beat. Things everybody can relate to. The heart stops ringing and your pulse stops working. You know when the heart starts to ring again, your pulse comes back again. It's really a very strong, beautiful piece. The moment in mental the rest of the audience can follow it because the heart stops to ring, you know, and then it starts again. And and um, that happens more than once, and so the audience gets the moment. Um, so I would do that. That's terrific. About, that I wrote called uh, Tools, Tools of Enchantment. And, uh, one, and it's about having some of those moments, and Tools of Enchantment. Simply, uh, and this is a really simple thing, but simply touch somebody on their third eye area, rub it gently, and go ah, and then talk to them. But that's powerful in real performance. So, uh, tools of enchantment has a lot of that kind of stuff in it too. Awesome, awesome, great, great materials here. This is terrific. Let me uh, sorry, before we move on. Before we move yeah. on, because I know we're running through time, and I, I want to get as many questions as possible too, but I need to say yeah. this. Um, um, I, I've, I've, I've now created, produced, released 80 some ebooks and 50 some audio and video pieces. Okay, so I've, I've put a lot out there for Magic and Mentalist, um, and now I'm kind of moving to a direction where um, I'm looking for the people that really, really want to work on the deeper stuff. So if things like The Ringing Heart or things that are 
like, wow, I want to connect with people or I want to understand minimalism at a deeper level. You're the kind of person I want to, I want to uh, kind of work with in the future. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be, um, I'm not going to be putting out lots of stuff in the future the way I have been in the recent past. I, I put out tons and that, and really, you should have enough for a couple lifetimes. But for those people who are sincere, who want to, uh, or are really want to work, you know, on a, on a deeper level and really get into this stuff. Um, I'm going to be doing something I can't really talk about yet quite, but uh, if, you're, if you feel like you're one of those people that want to really delve in and work, work on deeper levels of my material, um, drop me an email at info at wonderwizards.com and put like FCM or something like that, bold letters in the subject heading, and I will add you to our email list so that when I make the new announcement of how I will be working with... Uh, just a select bunch of people, uh, then I'll I will let you know so you can have that opportunity too. That's great. Well, you know, you can consider my email already in that list right now, but uh, I will send you one myself. You know, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, you know, you did send an email yesterday where you detailed that and gave that information along with a number of other points and and hot links to things. And you know, with your okay, I would love to you know publish you know, the body of that email so that FCM users can get a reference to it and find things about your metal bending and about, uh, and about getting on to, uh, you know, this list if they're really serious. Um, yeah, so I'm sure. Take a look at that, and if it's okay, I'll post that later on. Sure, absolutely, because I, I really want people who want to keep working on the, with stuff with me and get into my stuff at a deeper level to be able to do that. It's, right. uh, but but ever, anybody else who's just not ready, that's fine. I have no problem with it. Like I said, I've, I've given you lots of stuff to keep you busy for a long time. Um, but I'm looking for those special people that really, uh, you know, really want to work on work on my stuff at a deeper level. So absolutely, like like you said, there's already lifetimes of study out there. But uh, you know, we we can't get enough of it. It's great. Um, I, I will jump back to the list. You know, we don't we don't have a, an imposed deadline on us here, but you know, we do want to work within your availability. So, uh, you know, I'm good for for a bit, quite a bit longer if you would like to keep going. But we'll touch on a couple more questions here. Um, so let me see here for a second. We had uh, let's see, Fred Rosenbaum asked of your entire body of work, which do you feel is the most underrated or unknown, and what do you wish we would read but aren't reading? <laughs> Uh, well, I think I already read Fred's mind. Um, <laughs> yep, but I think so. I, let, me re, let me re let me restate. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, mystery by association. Yep. Uh, is, is something I'm I'm shocked that people haven't gotten. There's some really great stuff in there, but more importantly, there are things that you need to understand in there that you can use and apply to whatever you do, whatever you're already doing. Um, same with genuine amazement. That's another one. Uh, and anti tada is another. All of those that, on the surface, you might think it's it's one thing, but if you start getting into it, I think you'll realize quickly this is where the real power is. You know, it's that stuff is is right up there with Wonder Words, uh, in my opinion. Uh, same with its suggestion. Uh, its suggestion is right up there too. So. Uh, those would be those would be some of them that I am I'm literally amazed at how many people haven't found them yet because uh, yep. there's some some of the greatest work I could ever probably cram into things not just from tricks but on deeper levels um, that are but still in ways that are simple to understand and really commercial I mean I did one thing out of its suggestion in some lectures that I did recently which I don't do very many of. And uh, and I nailed massive amounts of magicians and mentalists, well-known magicians and mentalists, with a Svengali deck. Right. Because Great. I used what's what's in those books. So those those are works I definitely suggest you look into. That's terrific. That's terrific. I'll I'll, I'll feed you one more here. I, I have no idea what your answer to this one will be, but I, I like people to know that we're seeing their questions. We have a question from Rob Krampus. He says, I make my money as a fortune teller. Can you give me any advice on fortune telling? Wow. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, look, you know what you, you know. You know what you're doing. I put out a lot of reading systems uh, that I think you'll probably find valuable. If, if um, as a fortune teller, if you do lots of readings, um, then I would suggest you look into some of my other kinds of readings because you want to be unique. You know, anytime you do any kind of readings, you want to do things that are that are unique and special and set you aside apart from other people. So I would definitely consider that. If you're really, really serious, I would look into the mind reading lessons um, because that also has to do with readings, but only if you're really serious. Um, and other than that, what I say to anybody doing readings is this. Um, don't give, do not give advice. By CE, meaning that you people already have enough of their own vices. <laughs> they, they don't right. need you to give them more. So, right. so don't give advice. I, I would say you can certainly say you tend to be this kind of thing if you keep up the certain pattern, you know, this tends to be what happened. Um, so you might want to consider different options, you know. But always put the responsibility back on the person and and never tell them what to do. You know, let them decide what they need to do for themselves. Right, right. Well, I mean, there's a big difference between being an entertainer and a, and a trained counselor. So that is too big a responsibility, I think, for most people. I know it is for me. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think you have to be very, very careful about all that. I'm not against it. I think you just have to really know what you're doing and be very careful about it. And, you know, one of the other things I should say about that is if you do any kind of readings at all, I don't care if it's for performing or if it's, you know, because you do readings, you need to remember that every single thing you say is a suggestion. It is a powerful suggestion that you're putting into people's heads. Right. So if you say to someone, I said this in Wonder Words, if you say to someone, go with your feeling, you have to think of whether or not that person might be going, I hate my girlfriend, I want to kill her. Right. If you say, go with your feelings, they might go, okay, thanks, and go kill somebody. Right, so, or themselves. Yeah, or themselves. So so you can't do this crap that, that other mentalists teach you to do because they don't understand this stuff. They're just trying to sell you cold reading tools. They don't really care. You know, it's, they're just trying to sell to each other. It's a horrible situation we're in right now. Right. But what you really need to do is think about how everything is a suggestion, so you better be careful about what you're putting into people's heads. And if you do that, no matter what kind of readings, whether it's fortune telling or doing readings on stage, you, you will be better off and so will your audience. Right, right. Great advice. But you knew. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, let me let me, sh let me shift gears for a second. Um, and I know personally, I don't know if many people know this about you. I know a lot do. Um, you know, one of my big inspirations in in life and art is uh, is music. And I know that this is something for you as well. And I, I don't know how many people watching today are really aware of it who haven't, you know, friended you in the past or seen some of your your other material. But would you like to tell us a little bit about bowl sounds? Uh, yeah, well, I'm um, uh, a lot of long history, but I was uh, I've been around uh, Tibetan bowls for a long time. I had a had a friend of mine who was uh, a Tibetan bowl player and what many would refer to as an honest to goodness mystic. Um, I did some music. I grew up doing music. Music was always part of like with me as my saving grace along with magic. Um, and so as time went on, some things happened in my life, and I ended up um, in the position where I was needing to do more and more uh, music things. And so um, part of what I do now, the reason I'm here <laughs> right this moment, is uh, talking with you is because uh, I play music on Tibetan and quartz crystal bowls. And uh, in, I'll move out of the way. You can kind of see part of the, <laughs> a little bit of what I'm working with tonight. There's a few. There's a gong there. There's a few down here. You can see. There's a. Few. That's just some of the bowls that I play, um, with uh, play musically. 
And so those are the, uh, that's what, what I do these days is I also uh, play various kinds of music, but I also play this, these, which they sound if you... They have a very unique sound, so... Much better. So they, uh, they're very good for taking uh, people into very deep places within themselves and um, put out a piece called The Guide, which is uh, something I actually use. Um, but there's also a training version of it on our website, um, The Guide, which tells you about the linguistics involved and... Uh, and helps people get into their own relaxed state, and uh, you can use it as your own training kind of tool too. So, so yeah, I do that. And the music, if you're so inclined to listening to, um, that's at Bowl Sounds, B O W L, not E L, B O W L, Sounds, BowlSounds.com. That's great. That's great. I think you also have a Facebook page for Bowl Sounds, I believe. Which people can find, right? Yeah, but if you go to if you go to bowl sounds, if you go to bowlsounds.com, you you'll see it's real easy. You can look around, see if it's your kind of thing or not, and That's then you'll be able to click on. Uh, you'll see a thing. Well, as as I said, I, I do hope to be able to uh, see a, one of your concerts one of these days myself. I, I really love the sound. It's got a very mesmerizing feeling to it, and uh, and so I'm, I've been fascinated with many kinds of music, but that as well. So let's see. I wish you could be here with us tonight, but uh, <laughs> it'll be yeah, a nice I, night tonight, I am sure. But I always look forward to it, and we'll, we'll, if nothing else, maybe we'll catch up and sit on it. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm hoping also to see you in, the, in the, at uh, Jeff's place in October. You're going to be there, correct? For the Magic meeting this year? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Uh, yes. Indeed. That will be great. So let's see. I'm, I'm going to check the list here one more time and make sure we're not dropping <laughs> anybody. But, uh, when I, like when I play bulls, I, I'll, I'll borrow a couple of jobs. Yeah. Uh, excellent. I think we're pretty pretty good on uh, what people have been asking. Uh, there's a few things that I think you've answered already that uh, would be repetitive if I, uh, if I asked them again. I'm just looking over. Let's see. So you talked about some of your new material that's uh, coming out and how people can stay in touch with it. And well, yeah, there's a there's a brand new thing um, that we haven't even officially announced yet um, that I did with uh, Oliver Dobbs, and uh, if you go to my website, uh, you'll check you can check that out too. Uh, it's a really really strong kind of thing if you want to do real looking mentalism. There, this is stuff for you. I should say, however, um, that unlike work, uh, this is going to take some mental effort for you to, to do. It's, uh, so I think it's going to be a, an overnight thing. It's not. <laughs> it's okay. work. I have made versions. I have put versions in there. The pin number effect you can do almost right away. But the other two pieces you're going to have to work at. Um, but but it's, it's definitely, again, if you're serious at all about mentalism and studying psychology and that kind of thing, you'll want to get that just to start thinking about, because it'll inspire you to think about all these things in really different ways. So even if you don't do any of the effects, and if you don't do any of the effects, the principles, the ideas in that work are really powerful too. So so get Kenton's keys to play with and, and learn things in a fun way, and then if when you want to really hunker down and put your mind through some paces, uh, look into imaginative mind reading with Oliver Dobbs and myself. Yeah. Imaginative mind reading. I'm a, actually, somebody just asked what, what, what new product should we look out for, and I'm going to write that right into the thread. There you go. Yeah, it's just... Awesome. Awesome. I'll be looking for that myself. So that's, that's to be available soon, not quite yet, correct? 
It is available now, as of today on the website. Oh, yeah. it's available as of today. Great, great. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I, I, I hope you get, uh, get a few people punching right in on the site after this, uh, after this interview. So that would be wonderful. I think uh, you probably have an order. For yeah, there's a, there's a ton of, there's a ton of stuff. Um, that's something probably I suppose we should address briefly too. Is uh, <laughs> I had, a, I, as I was telling you the other day, I had a had a business meeting a couple weeks ago, and a, um, somebody that was at the meeting said, you know, Kenton, um, you know, and like in the Magic Cafe and some of those other places, yes, FCM, people talk about you, and they talk about, oh, you're a legend and all that stuff, but they all think that you quit creating things like five. Wow, right. really? And they said, yeah, they always ask, oh, where did Kenton disappear to? Well, now I kind of am going to do that, but... But I, you know, if you if you haven't looked in any of my stuff because you you think I stopped at Wonder Words or I stopped after a few things that, that your dealer carries, it's because I quit letting the dealers have all right. most of the important stuff after Words and Colossal Killer. Most of the important stuff has been written since dealers were able to. Get it. So. If you haven't been to my website at wonderwizards.com um, or haven't been there for a while, now you want to check things out and really look around because you have probably missed out on the majority of my work uh, because dealers don't have it. I haven't let them have it. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that you've probably missed out on at the website. Right, right. Well, there is, there is a tremendous amount, and I, I'm I, I'm the owner of a good deal of it myself that I just haven't had time to digest yet, but I'm still working on it. And it's uh, it's a it's a great study, and I find it some of the most valuable, mind bending, <laughs> mind expanding things I've read. Uh, so, you know, I, well, it's kind of it's kind of started. It's kind of started. If you like a lot of the modern things, I would say check out my work because you'll probably find out where it first began. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. You yes. know, a I mean, lot of it, it's like a lot of the stuff is of mine is now just getting repackaged and resold. Right. With new label and name on it, and you're or, probably better learning it from the original stuff first. Sure, sure. Or, or in many cases, people that have learned directly from you, who we, we interview and see commentary by people like Peter Turner and Fraser Parker all the time, and they continually cite you as yeah, the inspiration okay. mentor. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's nice yeah. to see people who are... If you doing... like those guys... Sure. Yeah, if you like those guys, if you like my students, you might want to look into my work as well, because to find out where they're kind of coming from and to get other things that, you know, they can't tell you, but the, the, yep. that has inspired a lot of what they do, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very happy and very proud of my students. They're pretty brilliant people. That's for sure. Right. As well you should be. As well you should be. Uh, I'm still seeing things pop up here. Uh, let's see. We have yeah, one. Ahead. Okay. Here's one Laura likes to ask of, of people being interviewed, so we'll toss this one in, and, and maybe that'll probably be it. But if you could spend an afternoon with any magician or mentalist, past or present, who would it be and why? Hmm. Uh -huh. I, I guess... I guess the only thing that really comes to my mind would be Tarbell, and the reason is Tarbell is closest probably to me, to who I'm to what I'm like, um, and I would love to have known some more of where he was coming from. When I started reading the Tarbell course, uh, the first volume, I read certain things in there, and I thought, "Wow, this is." Like, you're talking almost like real magic stuff, you know? And this is exciting. This is like, you're going to tell me, like, the real secrets, you know, the real cool things. And uh, and he hinted at some pretty interesting ideas. And, and he would kind of scatter them through his work. And I thought, later years, I went, wow, this he writes at a couple different levels at once. And I really appreciate that. You know, he would always teach about 
psychology of something and why it's important and the theater behind it and you know all the, how to connect with people how to get you know have a pleasing enough personality that people like you and want to you know be around you and all that stuff all those things are active groups that are part of what I do um, but he also had a, a tendency I was talking to a couple guys off the uh, one was off the old Blackstone senior show. Um, another was off of another famous show. And they, they were laughing and they said, you know, Kenton, yeah, you would have gotten along with Tarbell because we walked into a one morning to a, to a huge Mac convention in the dealer's room and before the dealer's room was open and Tarbell had somebody because he was doing some kind of work on him to heal him. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he was, he was, we were making, we, go, we don't know what to think. We thought it was pretty weird. They said, but the person felt better. So, you know, they were, they got whatever they were trying to get out of it. And, right. uh, you know, so I think I would, I would love to hang out with Tarbell and find out. That would be incredible. Now, yeah. Yeah. So, it turns out the person I learned. I was around the Bulls from actually was married to uh, to someone in the Tarbell family. <laughs> we didn't know that for a lot of years, and then uh, wow. long after Harlan had passed. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny connection. Any rate, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to the list just a couple, one or two more times because I think people are sensing that we're winding things up and they're panicking and putting stuff in. But one of them is a sure. message, not a question. Uh, we have a message to you okay. from. Peter Turner saying, hey, Pa, hope you are well. Hey, so Sonny. You, <laughs> man. Yes. So we'll, you know how I am. <laughs> what's that? That's how I am. There you go. We will be, we will be talking. We'll be talking. Great. Great. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll give another question from Laura. She asks, how do you feel about creators that release variations of your creations? Well, I appreciate people that contact me and say, what do you think of this? Am I stepping on your toes? Is this, uh, you know, or is this different enough? Is it okay? Um, those people are rare. And I think the reason is because sometimes I say no. <laughs> like, I once had somebody write me and say, but I used a red deck, and you talked in your description, it's a blue deck. So how <laughs> dare you? It's different. <laughs> and they were just all kinds of upset. Um, and I had a couple other people that recently created some things, and I said, you know, this is really very close to something else of mine, and what you're doing is very, it's really common on the Internet. And, and I could have done that, too. I just saw it and went, no, now it's making the rounds on the Internet. I don't want to add that in to what I'm already doing. Right. Um, but I've done what I do for years, so I'd rather have you not put it out. And then their responses is, well, we're sorry. it's going to be a big hit. And it's like, and it has been. Yep. Yep. That happens. My original work is far stronger. You know, the original work is a lot stronger. Um. So I, one of the things I would suggest if people are into some of the things that are modern right now, like, um, for example, like the 100th monkey thing, uh, if you like that, I would suggest you go to my website and look at Signs of Influence, um, because Signs of Influence, there are three versions of them, um, are really, really strong, powerful, full-color things, um, images that get people great stuff. It's a full act. Um, but look into signs of influence if you like some of that. So I, I'm happy when things ins to inspire people, but when you really inspire people, you know, my students are good examples. Pete Turner, right. Frazier, Luca, you know, when, when they do something and it's inspired by, they, they're really clear this was inspired by, you know, and they check with me and, you know, we do things together too. So, you know, it's a matter of respect or Right. And they'll burn themselves out. They'll get bored. And think is theirs. <laughs> they'll find out quickly that they don't like it either. Right. Right. Okay. So. 
Okay, we're we're breaking. I do. I, I'm very well aware of people who, who have done that. I I will say that people think I don't know. I'm very very clear on who who does things like that with my material and. Uh, and frankly, it's one of the reasons why I'm not going to be putting out lots more material for just anybody. It's why I'm focusing in on just um, people who are really serious and working with those people from now on. So, right. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, stay in touch. Being a part of that, that'll keep it safer. That's great, and it's you know it's really wonderful that you're extending that invitation to people who are who are listening here and who you know may be able to pass it to a few others. Um, and uh, it, it's great that you're, you know, giving us a, a peek into a, you know, a wider window of your work than maybe a lot of people are aware of here. Um, and hopefully people will then, you know, stick their head through that window and look around a little more. Uh, that's, what, that's what I'm going to be doing. Yeah, I hope so. Would hope others will do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump one last time it back. Will you, it will serve you very well. I can say, I can say without... I know this sounds egotistical, but it's not about ego. It's like having looked at lots and lots of stuff through the years and knowing what's out there and what I do and what other people do, including friends, I can say without without any doubt that if you really look and poke around and, and start playing with some of my work, it will radically change everything you do, and you'll be much better for it. I can say that with real confidence, uh, and my students are good examples of that. Yep. Yep. Well, they're they're certainly bringing a lot of attention, and uh, it's well deserved. I'm going to jump back one last time. I'll warn folks on the thread that we'll uh, we'll wait for more questions for next time. But we have one question from Rick Rule, and he's uh, getting in under the wire here. Do you think the true identity of Erdnase will ever be discovered? Hmm. Well, some would say <laughs> it has. <laughs> um. You know what? I, I think you'll have to ask Ricky J about that. Uh, um, you know, Ricky knows people who we can't even say their names. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and uh, and you know, though I would say Ricky would be the person to tell you whether or not that's ever going to happen in a way that's public. But don't right. even touch that. Right. Well, it has been a tremendous privilege and honor to talk with you today. Um, and I, I know that people were, were, not only were a lot of people watching and listening, uh, but a lot more people will be in the coming days as we, uh, as we continue to post the thread for this. Um, anybody who is you know, listening who has not been to wonderwizards.com, www.wonderwizards.com, I suggest you go there right after this interview and start exploring the world of things, of material, that is there waiting for you. Uh, it is far more than you'll be able to digest in, in anything but a good deal of time. I, I know that from experience. Um, but as Kenton's mentioned, uh, there's just a tremendous amount that will expand your mind in a lot of new directions if you, if you just go into that. Um, so I'd also like to thank... Uh, Laura Isley for setting up this interview as well as many many others uh, and I'm always amazed at the at the people that Laura <laughs> is able to bring on this uh, this program it's it's an inspiration to all of us um, and before I jump off I, I have to remember to, to announce you know mention that our next interview will be on August 12th which is next Tuesday I believe uh, it's going to be magician mentalist Kevin Kunley hosted by Morgan Strebler uh, and so with that, uh, I want to I want to wish Kenton a huge, huge, huge thank you one more time uh, from everyone at FCM. And uh, if thank you, can, you, Andy. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. Always nice to be with everybody. Here. That's great. We we hopefully we'll see you again in the future, not too long. We've seen you a few times, and it's really a pleasure to be the one talking to you this time. And I really look forward to seeing you again in person as well. So. And let me let me say again. Well, I'm going to make one last plea. If, if the people listening to the FCM group that are serious and really want to get into my material deep, please drop me an email. Check out the links. That, so you drop me an email properly and uh, get my attention uh, with the FCM subject matter. And so I'll add you to our list. And then when we make the new announcement of how to get in in our 
We will. We will do that. Oh, I don't want to step on you. We're having a little break up in the audio here. But yes, we'll be posting that link again the minute that I get off of this <laughs> off of this connection. So, again, uh, thank you very much, Kenton, and uh, we'll see you all next time here, and hope to see you again one of these days really soon. So thanks very much, Kenton. Thank you. Off to do bowling. Take care.